30 named storms, seven major hurricanes. 2020 was the most active hurricane season on record. Tonight, we look ahead to the 2021 season. What to expect? I think Houston keeps dodging the bullet, but um, there's a big one coming. And how to prepare and keep your family safe. Presented by Generator Industries, KPRC's Severe Weather Team brings you this Hurricane and Flood Survival Guide. Good evening. I'm KPRC Chief Meteorologist Frank Billingsley. Uh, it may not seem like Southeast Texas has been spared when we've seen Hurricane Harvey and Tropical Storm Imelda in the last four years. And of course, just last year, we witnessed the devastation Hurricane Laura caused our nearby neighbors in Southeast Texas and Southwest Louisiana. No matter how many storms develop, it only takes one to turn our lives upside down. And so that's why in the more than 30 years that I've been forecasting weather here for you, my message remains the same. Be prepared. Tonight, we'll help you get ready for this year's hurricane season. We'll go over supplies, insurance, evacuation plans, and even answer some of your questions. We'll also update you on some of the flood mitigation plans that were proposed after Harvey. And a look at the impact of climate change on storms. So whether you're a lifelong resident of the area or you're new to Southeast Texas, we're here to help you get ready starting now. We're going to head out of this studio in a bit to show you where the KPRC team works around the clock during storms like hurricanes. But we're starting right here in our severe weather center by talking about the storm predictions for this year. Well, we've already seen the first storm of the year. Tropical storm Ana stayed away from land and dissipated in the Atlantic. This year, scientists with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration are predicting above average activity. With up to 20 named storms over the next six months or so, six to 10 of those are expected to reach hurricane status, with as many as five major hurricanes, category three or higher. Those are storms with winds of more than 110 miles per hour. Last year's record number of storms has climate experts concerned. Multiple studies show that climate change, specifically global warming, could be impacting the strength and intensity of storms that develop. The 2020 hurricane season was the fifth consecutive above average season, and it tied with a record number seven major hurricanes, storms which reached category three or above, including Hurricane Laura, which hit Louisiana as a category four storm. Concerning statistics for scientists. Climate change has not been directly linked to the frequency of named storms, tropical storms, um, but it has been linked to an increase in intensity of storms. So once they do form, they have an, a possibility to get to those category four and five storms. Experts are also concerned about just how quickly those storms intensify as they approach land, a process called rapid intensification. That is uh, what happened with Harvey. Harvey was a tropical cyclone out in the Gulf, just a storm. And overnight it became a cat four and made landfall basically within 24 hours. Laura last year was a category one and overnight became a category three. Laura and another nine storms underwent rapid intensification in 2020, tying the number of storms to do so since 1995, according to Yale University. Here is Phil Bedian, director of the Severe Storm Prediction Education and Evacuation from Disaster Center to explain and we're seeing a general increase in that water temperature. And of course it's water temperature and air temperature, uh, along with all of the other meteorological parameters that tend to set it up for a, a, a massive storm to both get created and to also continue to get fed by that energy. Also a concern, the amount of rain produced by these stronger storms, which could lead to more flooding. We're gonna see another huge rainfall event or what would be much worse for us is a big surge event. So can we go back? Is there a way to reduce global warming and reverse the apparent trend in our hurricane season? I don't think we're ever going to be able to go back because we've, we've, done, we've done a lot of harm uh, to planet Earth. We, re we really have over the years. And it's exacerbated and accelerated in recent years. Bedient says now we need to rely on technology and infrastructure to help protect our coastline, such as the much talked about Ike Dyke and Coastal Spine projects. We can no longer afford to wait for some magical you know, solution to fall out of the sky. 
We'll update you on a few of those flood control projects ahead. But first, let's talk about evacuations. It doesn't happen often, but when it does, KPRC2 traffic expert Anavid Reyes wants you to know if you are in an evacuation zone and the best route to take to get out. It's one of the most important pieces of information to know when it comes to hurricane season, your evacuation zone. It's key to knowing when you should leave and when you should stay put and ride out the storm. When the time comes, I am formally declaring a voluntary evacuation of residents in evacuation zones A and B in Harris County. You need to be ready. No, we're going to leave. We're going to leave. No sense in riding it out. We've got kids and family. No sense. That's why you must know your zone. Families in the purple zone will be the first to be told to evacuate. If the storm is strong enough, expect the yellow zone to get the evacuation order next, followed by the green and orange zones. It's important that those folks that have potentially deadly consequences from not evacuating, letting them get out first in a staggered way uh, and make that as efficient and as easy as possible. As you'll see, a big part of our region is not in an evacuation zone and would be encouraged not to get out on the road. This is important so we don't see a repeat of the Hurricane Rita evacuation in 2005 when dangerous gridlock on highways sadly resulted in lives lost. If evacuations are called and you need to leave, you must know the best route. There are some designated evacuation routes that have been worked on by local, state partners and transportation partners. Wide shoulders on some highways will become evacu lanes, creating an extra lane for traffic. Contraflow lanes are also possible, and that's when inbound highway lanes are reversed. So both sides of the highway go the same direction. But a word of caution when picking your destination. Don't evacuate from one hurricane affected community to another area that might be affected by a hurricane. If you live in an evacuation zone but are not able to leave on your own, register for evacuation assistance now by calling 211. This is something you have to do every year. So important, you register and make a plan now. Well, last year was a very active season. We went through the 21 names on last year's list, plus nine names from the Greek alphabet. The World Meteorological Organization says they'll no longer use the Greek alphabet to name storms, but instead they'll use a supplemental list of names. Now, hopefully, we don't need them. You can see a list of names for this year's storms, along with numerous resources available to help you with your storm preps, right now on our website. You'll find checklists for before, during, and after a storm in the hurricane section of clicktohouston.com. Still ahead, we head to the newsroom where consumer expert Amy Davis is gathering information about flood and wind insurance for you. Plus, we'll show you the new tool at KPRC2 that allows us to track rainfall and flood risks, how it works, and the partnership that makes it possible. But first, meteorologist Justin Stapleton joins us to tell us exactly what we need in our hurricane kit. Frank, having that kit ready is key, and having it mobile in case of an evacuation is very important. Non-perishable food and water top the supply list. Make sure you have one gallon of water per person per day for three to five days. You'll also want a manual can opener, a first aid kit, personal hygiene items, things like toothpaste and toilet paper, and flashlights with extra batteries. We posted online that one of our producers uses portable lanterns, and a lot of you chimed in that that's worked great for you too. Jessica Clemens wrote, we have eight of those and we've used them for years. We still use them anytime the power goes out. A very important thing to remember to keep with you, any medication that you may need for both your family and your pets. On KPRC2's Facebook page, Brenda Parsons joined our conversation about preps with this important reminder. If you have to evacuate, take your pets with you. And Cynthia Reiner said, keep extra cans of pet food and a pet carrier. Other items to have for your pets, things like extra water, collars, leashes, and up-to-date vaccination records in case you have to go to a shelter or find a place to board them. You can find more information on what to have in your hurricane kit on our website, clicktohouston.com slash hurricane. Tonight, we're providing a progress report on projects proposed to reduce flooding. Along Bray's Bayou, the Harris County Flood Control District and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers have come together for 75 projects along the 31-mile waterway. Construction will be finished next year. 
Right now, crews are working to elevate several bridges over the bayou so flowing water doesn't hit the bridge, helping get water to the Gulf instead of into people's homes. When water is threatening homes, the phones in our newsroom assignment desk don't stop ringing. People want answers as to their risk. And now we have them. KPRC2 has launched a new tool. In association with the Harris County Flood Control District, we can track bayou status. Meteorologist Eric Great shows us how it works. Harvey, Imelda, Tax Day, Memorial Day, all standout flood events in Houston over the past few years. But it's not just the marquee events. Flash flooding in and around Houston happens a lot. Keeping you as informed as possible is our mission. And now we're taking it up a notch. We have partnered with the Harris County Flood Control District to show you live information from their website. So in our flood warning system network, we have about 280 gauges. And we're bringing them all to you. We go to the north, got 9600's Bray's Bayou and Lawndale Street. These are real time. Rainfall and stream level data from gauges spread all over area waterways. In the past hour, we've seen rainfall rates anywhere from about a quarter to a half inch. We can manage that. Priceless information our weather team has relied on for years during flood coverage. Anyone can see it on the Harris County Flood Warning System website. Now we've got it in our arsenal during live storm coverage. Ponding is an issue on area roadways, especially in western Harris County. Real data with simple color coding to show you where the rain is coming down hardest and where street flooding is most likely. More people are going to be able to use that data and make decisions that they need to be making when we're having flooding in this area. We're monitoring stream levels too. We can show you if your local bayou creek or stream is in danger of flooding. Again, simple color coding, green, yellow, and red. Mound Creek, a little Mound Creek off of Mathis, and of course Spring Creek, we've been watching that. For every marker on this map, we've got a detailed dashboard that shows the stream status at that location. Let me show it to you. We've got rainfall totals. We've got the trend of the stream levels. We've also got the flood threat. Green means good. Yellow indicates that the level of the stream is getting close to the top of bank and that flooding is possible. Red indicates that the level of the stream is above the top of bank and flooding is likely. The database has taken 40 years to build and with technology expanding, there is no plan to stop. I think that's what we've been working on together is, is a bigger platform of, of getting this data to the public so they can make decisions. KPRC2 and the Harris County Flood Control District, partners committed to keeping you informed and safe when the next flood event unfolds. Watching the flood gauges on KPRC2 can give you a heads up as to whether bayou levels are threatening homes in your area. The past few years have demonstrated that homes that have never flooded before can. Here in our newsroom, consumer expert Amy Davis is always working tirelessly to save you heartache as well as money. Well, she's here to go over the different types of insurance to protect your home. Frank, Hurricane Harvey is a great example of why you need flood insurance on top of a homeowner's policy. More than six out of every 10 homeowners who flooded during the storm did not have flood insurance. The average flood policy in Texas costs about $700 a year and takes about 30 days to become effective, so don't wait. But flood insurance only covers water that rises into your home. Wind is another story and another policy. A residential windstorm policy from the Texas Windstorm Insurance Association, or TWIA, costs on average about $1,600 a year. Other things to think about, neither policy covers damage from mold or living expenses in case you have to move out of your home while it's being repaired. And no matter how much it costs to rebuild, flood insurance from the National Flood Insurance Program will never pay out more than $250,000. No matter where you get your flood and windstorm insurance, the next thing you wanna do is take pictures and video of your home and belongings. Store them in a safe place where you can access them if you need to file a claim. We've got much more information for you on wind and flood insurance on clicktohouston.com slash hurricane. After all that we've weathered, we know hurricane season causes worry. But the best way to reduce anxiety is to be prepared, to be informed. As Amy Davis just mentioned, our digital team is always working to make sure that the information you need is available when you need it. We also turn to social media for your questions and advice on the hurricane season. Meteorologist Justin Stapleton is here with that. 
One of the most frequent questions the KPRC2 Severe Weather Team is asked on our social media is about the difference between watches and warnings. The simple answer is a watch is when conditions are there for a weather event like a tornado or flash flooding to occur, but it hasn't happened yet. A warning is when we're actually seeing evidence that the event is currently happening or tornado has been spotted on radar or that flooding is inevitable. When flooding is occurring, the thing we'll be saying over and over again on the air and online is turn around, don't drown. It only takes a foot of rushing water to wash away a small car. And sadly, we've reported on a number of deaths during tropical events of people who died in their cars in flood water. On our website right now, you'll find information on how to escape your car if you end up in the rising water. Plus, you'll learn exactly what to do if a power line comes down on or near your vehicle. We're also breaking down the safest spots in your home to take cover if a tornado warning is issued. Hopefully we get through this season with minimal tropical impacts, but if we do see a storm, fortunately for people new to the area, there are a lot of us that have experience and suggestions to make it less stressful. Lira Lock on our Facebook page recommends having paper plates, cups, cutlery, and napkins because dishes are hard to clean. That's especially true if we run into water issues like we did during the February freeze. KPRC2 anchor Sophia Ojeda jumped into our Storm Prep Facebook post to share that she's been picking up a gallon or two of water every time she shops. Well, that's helpful because there's often a run on supplies and empty shelves just before a storm hits. And our own Frank Billingsley reminded people to keep cash on hand. When power is out, ATMs and credit card machines won't work. Speaking of cash, a penny may be all you need to know if the food in your freezer thawed during an outage while you were away from home. I'll tell you how ahead in this half hour. But first, it was a hot topic after Hurricane Harvey, the potential addition of a third reservoir in Harris County. An update to that project. And generators have proven their worth during hurricanes and even during this year's winter storm. But how big of a generator do you need? Advice from the experts, next on KPRC2's Hurricane and Flood Survival Guide. It's time for a progress report. Those in West Harris County near the Barker and Attucks Reservoirs who want flood relief from a third reservoir will continue to wait. One of the flood mitigation proposals is the Cypress Creek Overflow Management Plan. That plan mentioned a possible third reservoir to the north, among several other recommendations to the Cypress Creek watershed. At this point, the Army Corps of Engineers tells us the recommendations from their study are pending with no scheduled release date. KPRC2 can bring you live drone views of flooding and damage after a storm. We also bring you live coverage of driving conditions in case for some reason you have to leave your house or work. Typically it's hot and muggy when our crews hit the roads in these storm tracking vehicles, but this year we got a frigid reminder it's best to be prepared all year long. And as meteorologist Cambrell Marshall shows us, that has made generators one of the hottest products on the market. In the last nine months, families in Southeast Texas have faced power outages from the February freeze. 15 hours at a time, and it was very cold. Hurricane Laura, last August. With the heat, it was unbearable. And run-of-the-mill thunderstorms like the ones we got hammered with in May. Anytime we have an extended outage, that's fuel for generator sales. KPRC has a large generator to keep us going if power ever goes out in this area, but most homes can get by with a much smaller, more affordable unit. But we are installing them as quickly as we can, and we've got lots more generators on the way. Dennis Hart from Generator Industry says demand remains high. Generators that come into their warehouse quickly go right back out. This is a peace of mind product. This is something where you won't have to worry about evacuating your home uh, if, in the case of a, of a com coming storm. If you rely on power for medical devices, don't want to lose hundreds of dollars worth of groceries, or dread the thought of an August day without AC, a generator may be the solution. We can just run the whole home. To keep your whole house running, you'll need a larger standby unit. These primarily run on natural gas or propane and can automatically kick on within 20 seconds of the power going off. There are smaller solutions that require gas and a little manual effort to get running. A portable generator is likely you can get that to power some refrigeration, um, maybe some lights and fans. 
maybe if you have a, a, an aquarium, that type of thing. But the portable units are good in a pinch. If you do opt for a portable unit, Hart says there are important safety steps owners should know. They have to be at least five feet away from the structure and they need to be outside. Don't run the portable unit in a garage or too close to the house. He says having working carbon monoxide and smoke detectors is also important. And he says no matter what size the generator, regular maintenance is needed to make sure that it works when you need it, whether it's during a tropical storm or an arctic blast. With the February freeze fresh in our memories, concern about the power grid this hurricane season is high. Coming up tonight, KPRC2 Investigates digs deeper into ERCOT's failure and the work being done to prevent another disastrous outage. Watch Power Struggle, the Texas energy crisis at 7.30 here on KPRC2. But first, we've been talking about it for years, an update to the Ike Dyke proposal. Plus, I'll be back with information on how to know if you can keep the food in your fridge and freezer or if you should just toss it out after a power outage when KPRC's Hurricane and Flood Survival Guide continues. In Galveston, we're tracking the progress of a flood project that has been talked about since Hurricane Ike hit in 2008. A bill that would create a Gulf Coast Protection District. It's finally passed both chambers of the Texas legislature. The bill creates a district to manage projects and offer solutions to mitigate storm surge. The goal would be to help eventually get the Ike Dyke completed. The Ike Dyke would create a series of coastal barriers, levees, and dunes in the Gulf of Mexico that would work as a shield from storms. Back at the Severe Weather Center now, where we track every system that develops. Longtime Houstonians will recall the term Ike Dyke came about after Hurricane Ike, which we watched closely in 2008. Well, we've had a lot of new families move to our area since then, and many even since Hurricane Harvey. So if you're new to the Gulf Coast and have questions, meteorologist Justin Stapleton has more answers. For those who have moved here recently, storm surge may be a new term. As you've just heard, the surge is what devastated our coastline during Ike in 2008. Right now on our digital hurricane and flood survival guide on clicktohouston.com, you can learn about storm surge, which is when those tropical winds push the water onto land. During Ike, that surge was more than 13 feet high in some areas. In the guide, you'll also see the wind speed for the different categories of hurricanes and what type of damage they can cause. A lot of people were without power for days and weeks due to Hurricane Ike's winds. And one question we've heard a lot since then is how long does my food in the refrigerator or freezer good in a power outage? The USDA says food is safe in the fridge for about four hours if you keep the doors closed. A full freezer can maintain its temperature for 48 hours. That time is cut in half if it's only half full. So what if you're not sure if the power was out for an extended time while you were away? Here's a helpful trick. Keep a penny on top of the container of ice. If things thaw and then refreeze once the power is restored, that penny will have sunk and be in the ice instead of on top of it. Again, all this information, along with how to keep your phone charged when we lose power, can be found on our website right now and whenever you need it this hurricane season. Frank? Remember, we'll be here with you no matter what develops this storm season. Up next, a KPRC2 Investigates special power struggle, the Texas energy crisis. And join me again for the late news at 10 p.m. For now, from your KPRC2 severe weather team, have a great night.